Welcome, everybody. It's um, wonderful to see so many people joining today's webinar. It's going to be a fantastic dialogue or trialogue between uh, three wonderful speakers. Um, I'm joining you from the Coast Salish territories of the Wasanish speaking peoples on southern Vancouver Island. And I invite all of you to acknowledge where you are joining from in your minds and hearts. My name is Monica Shore, and I'm the executive director of the Isak Olam Foundation. Uh, we are a partner of the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership, and uh, this webinar is part of the virtual, uh, the virtual campfire series, which started at the beginning of COVID and has been extremely successful. Uh, it's my honor to moderate today's webinar, and I don't think any of these speakers need moderation, um, as they are competent and eloquent, and I look forward to participating with all of you and learning more about Thaida and Nene. Um, this webinar, which is the third webinar of the uh, Legal Innovation Stream, um, has been organized um, and is being co-hosted by the CRP, the Isak Olam Foundation, and West Coast Environmental Law. So we're pleased to welcome you and thank you so much for joining us. You have a, a chat box if you have any questions or concerns or technical issues. We've got a team of uh, wonderful helpers here to, to support you. Um, Allison Bishop, the project manager of the CRP, Justine Townsend, if you wanna wave, wave your hand, um, are here to, to help. So you can mes message them privately as well if you'd like to. And um, if you're interested, if you missed any of the past webinars from the Virtual Campfire series, um, check out the CRP website and YouTube channel. They are there. Um, and if you want, you can also sign up to receive notifications for future webinars. Um, I wanted to let you know about the next webinar that's happening, um, which will be the final one for this calendar year. It's taking place on December the 3rd, and it's sort of the encore webinar, which will allow us to capture some of the questions that weren't, we, we didn't have time to answer in past webinars. Um, and it's called Ask Us Anything IPCAs. Um, it's really geared towards anyone interested in Indigenous-led conservation and IPCAs. There will be no formal presentations, but the members of this webinar and past webinars and the leadership circle of the CRP, um, many of those people will be here to answer any questions that have come up for you um, in, your, in your work on IPCAs um, as you study Indigenous-led conservation in whatever field or area you're in. So we do invite you to participate in that. Um, so think about questions and if, there's any, if there are any questions that weren't answered today, um, as I'm sure there will be, uh, plenty, we will save those and, and sort of bring those into the discussion. Um, so for housekeeping, we have two hours today or just under that. Um, if you could keep your mics muted um, while you're listening, that would be helpful. And uh, there'll be a, an opportunity for questions throughout. Um, our speakers are dynamic. They'll, um, they, you know, they, they welcome questions that are relevant to the topic being spoken of during but we will also save time at the end for um, a more extensive discussion. Um, and you can also, as I mentioned, use that chat box um, so that we can, our team Justine and Allison can sort of compile the questions and help ask them for you. So, um, oh, and a final note, uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the CRP website and YouTube in the coming weeks. Um, it's, uh, if you would prefer to not be seen in the recording, um, just turn off your camera and that'll solve that. Um, so without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our panel of speakers who will be sharing their knowledge and experience about Thaida Nenene. Stephen Nita brought his community of Lutsake Dene First Nations to the table with the government of Canada during his time as elected chief. On April the 10th, 2010, Lutsoke Dene First Nations signed a formal agreement to start negotiations on the creation of a protected area in Thaidene Nene, which was established in 2019. Stephen remains involved as a member of Thaidene Nene's management board, which is presently being established. Stephen is also a member of the CRP Leadership Circle and is a senior advisor to the Indigenous Leadership Initiative. Larry Innes is a partner at Ophius Clear Townsend, practicing in the area of Indigenous rights and environmental law. Larry was a member of the Thaidene Nene negotiations team, participated in the development of the Northwest, Terri North Northwest Territories Protected Areas Act, and provides legal advice to Lutselkia Dene First Nations on a wide range of lands, resources, and governance matters. 
Larry also leads the domestic law and policy stream of the CRP and is a strategic advisor to the Indigenous Leadership Initiative. Welcome both Stephen and Larry. And finally, last but not least, Stephen or Steve, who we may um, call Steve for the purpose of not confusing Stephen, Nita and Steve Ellis. Steve Ellis has been involved with Thai Daninani for 20 years, first as the manager of wildlife lands and environment for the Lutsake Dani First Nations, and then as a member of Thai Daninani's negotiating team. He remains engaged as a senior advisor to the First Nation on Thai Daninani implementation. Stephen also leads Makeways Northern Programming. And it should also be mentioned that our three speakers together formed the negotiating team for Thai Daninani. So thank you all for joining us. And I would love to pass the feather on to those we've been waiting to hear from. So over to you, Stephen. Let's see, Chul, Monica. Thank you for those uh, beautiful introductions. So I started off by saying thank, thank you all my relations for joining us today. I think it's important to acknowledge that that welcome, all my relations and my language is Sahelatine. From an indigenous perspective, when when you open up a, a a conversation like we're having today or making public statements, you hear a lot of indigenous people, indigenous leaders use that term, all my relations. What we mean by that is not just people. Uh, it's, it's, it's an uh, acknowledgement of responsibility that we have as human beings as a top of the food chain to the, to the responsibilities that we have for all living things within our sphere of influence within our territories. So we use that term, all my relations, uh, to, to, to remind ourselves that the work we do as leaders is important not only to, to those that we speak with, it's important to all life. It's about uh, understanding that ecosystems and, and, and being responsible for for your role in that in, in, in that relationship, in that symbiotic relationship that we all have with our territories. Saigon and Nene is uh, touted as a success story today, and it is a success story. It is the most progressive uh, relationship agreement between indigenous governments around the recognition of important areas and agreeing uh, to disagree in some places but more importantly, agreeing that uh, by working together, we could uh, we could uh, manage ourselves and our relationships within within space, like Saigon and Nene. Saigon and Nene certainly has a long, long and deep history uh, with our people, with the Dene, the uh, the folks around the southeast side of the Great uh, Northwest Territory. a place that we've been uh, managing for since time immemorial. It goes back to the time of uh, early creations, this time of giant beavers, giant animals before the Ice Age. That relationship has been going on and we had a law put down for us early in, in our relationship with Insight and Nene. I'll tell you the story of Tankwutheta, the old lady that sits in the falls. It's a, it's a time during some hard times when hunger was a big part of uh, everyday life for, for our people. And it starts, the story starts in Da Chokwe. Uh, if you look at a map, the English map will tell you uh, it's called Artillery Lake. But for my people, we call that Lake Dachokwe. It's named after uh, one of our early leaders, a guy named Dacho, whose uh, descendants still live in Shusage. He led his people 
chasing two giant beavers. Uh, one from uh, Dr. West towards the Great Slave Lake. About halfway uh, down the, the Dachokwe Desert, or also known as the Lockhart River today, uh, they, they harvested one of those giant beavers. As I said, there was a time of uh, despair, hunger. And uh, obviously the, the, the harvested beaver was shared amongst all the people. But one elderly lady who was, uh, who was uh, whose husband had passed on, no children, uh, Tonakia, we call them in our language, uh, wanted some beaver blood, but she was refused because uh, there wasn't enough to go around. The next day, uh, Dacho led his people after the second beaver, continuing going west towards the Great Slave Lake. And once, we got, once they got to the mouth of the river, this Neche, as we call it, uh, they realized that elderly lady wasn't with him anymore. So they Dacho sent back uh, two young, healthy runners to, uh, to, uh, to find her. And they found her exactly where they left the camp. Uh, she was sitting there, uh, and uh, she told the young young folks that uh, out of despair, she really, really communicated with the Creator. Uh, did a lot of prayer and a lot of soul searching, and the Creator came to, came down to her, and the Creator asked her to to be to volunteer for eternity, to sit in this spot, and to provide the people with uh, with the types of uh, helps that they need, physical, emotional, spiritual, any type of ailments that people have, can go to her and ask for her help, and go to her to, to directly speak through her to the Creator. And by the time uh, the young guys got to her, the rocks were already forming around her legs and arms. And she said, I'll be sitting here until the end of time. As long as I'm respected and re the area is respected, she'll be there for us, for all people, not just Lisa Gaidene. The area has to be respected. This was the first law that was given to the descendants of Tacho, the people of Lisa to protect that area. So Thaigenen Tankwisaita right now is the heart of Thaigenen Everything flows out from her. Thaigenen Nene uh, protects her ecosystem, her watershed. And we'll continue using inspiration from her to manage our, our relationship with Thaigenen Nene. It, that is very important for Tusegadene to share that knowledge. Indigenous people across this country and around the world have these special places, have these laws that are placed uh, in their hands to protect their their natural inheritance. We are all placed within our territories with special responsibilities. And places like Tanku Sada uh, reminds us of our continued responsibility to ensure that all our relations have a place that they can call home in a healthy environment. So that was the, uh, the instruction, early instructions and law that Lisa Gaidena used to pursue the protection of Saigon and is the most easterly community in the Northwest Territories. We are located on the east arm of the Great Slave Lake. We have a traditional territory of 200,000 square kilometers. Our closest neighbor to the east is Baker Lake in Nunavut. Our closest neighbor to the south is Fort Smith, uh, right on the Alberta border. To the southwest is the Ninuquan, our partner in treaty and relations. To the northwest is our partner, the Elmas Dene. 
and the city you own it. So we have a huge territory with it comes huge responsibility. So in 2000, the chiefs of the day uh, within the Quechua signed a framework agreement with Canada and the government of Northwest Territories to pursue a modern day treaty or a, it's called a land change process. That wasn't a new concept for, for Keto or the Susigay Dene elders. They know based on the experiences of other final agreements that were signed to the West and the Satu and the Guchin territory, up in the Nuvalu territory, that uh, it requires uh, the selection of lands uh, based on population, which help determine the quantum. The elders knew that uh, that type of land relationship would not satisfy uh, the, uh, the people and will be, make it difficult for our responsibility to be, to be exercised. They also wanted to protect uh, San and the watershed. And it was shortly after the largest stake and rush man has ever seen when diamonds were discovered in Northwest Territories. So that was uh, impetus for the elders to give us instructions to pursue a protected area within our within the heart of our traditional territory, within the heart of our territory. It's traditional and it's contemporary, so it's uh, it's alive today. So Steve uh, will uh, will discuss that a little further and how the community and the the, the staff uh, did some research to determine the type of protected areas that we wanted. So that work uh, went, went on for 10 years before we were able to uh, identify a partner that we wanted to, uh, we chose Parks Canada as a partner. One of the things you'll hear me repeating this, we chose Parks Canada. We initiated this. We initiated this because of our responsibility. It's important to understand that this idea was the leader in this whole process. It was choices that we made uh, that led to the relationship we have now. So I just wanted to, uh, to emphasize that, that uh, it was Lisa Gay that chose uh, Parks Canada as a partner. And the reason why we chose Parks Canada as a partner is, well, three main reasons. First of all, we have a treaty with Canada. Um, we call it the Treaty of 1900, which was made on July 25th, 1900 in Guinea Nequin. We also wanted a, a, a protected legislation that was respected not only in Canada, but globally. Thirdly, we wanted to create uh, a conservation economy around this. So tourism uh, and marketing is a strong point that Parks Canada has. So that's the three main reason why we chose Parks Canada as a partner. Parks Canada had an interest in part of Flight of Indiana early on. In the 1969, 1970, uh, they were uh, pushing for a national park the East Arm National Park of 7,000 square kilometers. In fact, it has uh, right around the same time the uh, uh, Minister Craig Chan was hanging around the west coast of Vancouver Island as well. So there was two areas that they wanted to uh, move forward as a national park. We said no. Uh, the chief of the day, uh, our hereditary chief, uh, Chief Joe Lockhart pretty much says, we're not interested. We don't like the way you operate in national parks. We would not be able to uh, do what we do within our territory. So pack your maps and leave town. Well, that's pretty much the message. That message was repeated several times over the years uh, until they just said, okay, we'll stop. We'll stop bothering you. And when we did give, uh, give a call, it was Chief Felix Lockhart uh, who uh, sent the letter to, uh, to uh, 
the CEO of Parks Canada to see if Parks was still interested. And that's how we started engaging with Parks Canada in a real heartfelt way. For Schlitzer, the relationship with Canada and Parks Canada is the first agreement that we've signed, that we've negotiated of any type of when it comes to uh, a relationship with la on land issues with Canada. For us, we negotiated based on the, our understanding and position of the treaty relationship that we have. When we entered treaty in 1900, we entered treaty to share our lands, our resources, and to benefit from those as well, and continue our responsibility within those regions. So for Saiten and Nina, the mandate that we had as a negotiating team was to respect the spirit and intent with which we entered treaty and build a relationship that speaks to that treaty relationship. So for us, this is the first implementation of the treaty relationship as we envisioned it when we entered the Treaty of 1900, where we agreed to share the lands, the responsibility for the management of it, and to benefit from it as well. So that pretty much sums up Saigon and Nina in a lot of ways. It is a relationship agreement more than anything else. It is a legal contract, but it is a relationship agreement. And that relationship recognizes the authority that Lusage has to maintain a relationship with Saigon and Nene and anyone else that has an interest in Saigon and Nene. And that's what we've negotiated with Parks Canada and the government of those territories, where we'll uh, uh, act as stewards on an equal basis, having our own resources to fulfill our end of the responsibility as described in the site of the establishment agreement and future management, uh, management plans. Larry Ennis will speak to, to the legal relationships there. But as a, from an, from a perspective, the first law was Sankusa Da and her instructions to us. The second law really came around when the elders uh, drew a map saying this is the area we want you to we want to protect. When the membership in the community accepted that boundary and named it Saigon and Nene, that was the second law. The Tlisigena law. These laws are not written in a in a textbook. It's not in the constitution, but these are within our own in individual constitutions. And the third law, uh, once we finalized the agreement, uh, we, we insisted the membership understand the agreement. As negotiators, our job was to explain the content of the agreement, but it was their responsibility to understand it and own it. So as part of that process, we wanted to make sure that all the members, doesn't matter where they lived, had an opportunity to vote on accepting or not accepting the establishment agreements that created the uh, and When the membership, uh, after a three month review, uh, many meetings, uh, lots of explanations voted to uh, to support the establishment agreements with 80% approval. That was the third law that listed a use to create site in Nina. And obviously our team uh, member, Larry Ennis and Steve Ellis as well, participated in the establishment of the Territorial Protectors and Areas Act. By the time that area, that legislation was being developed, site in Nina was, was uh, about 90% complete. So I think Saigon and Nina and the relationship that we've negotiated to, to that point uh, really influence and inform 
the Territorial Protected Areas Act, which we use along with those three laws from Houston uh, to protect the site in the Territorial Protected Area. And obviously, we all know the National Parks, the National Parks Act. And within the National Parks Act, there's a slew of regulations and policies. We'll use some, some of them, not all of them. And uh, so those are those are the laws that we use uh, to create site in Nene. And going forward, we're uh, we fit the pandemic shortly afterwards, so things have uh, slowed down. And uh, we are in the process of uh, creating a site in Nineveh Kwebaya T, or people that speak for site in Nineveh. That's the name of the management board. And that management board, uh, are responsible for creating a management plan based on obviously input from the parties. The parties to the agreement are Houston Parks Canada and the Government of Northwest Territories. The parties will appoint individuals to the management board or site in by a T. Once appointed, the individuals no longer represent the uh, the point the parties that appointed them. They represent and speak only for site in it. And once they make uh, decisions that it comes in the form of recommendations, I'm sure Larry will speak to you a little bit more. Once the parties uh, receive those recommendations, they will make a decision to accept them or not. And they have to have a really good reason not to accept them. I'm sure Larry will speak to that. But there, in, it, in that relationship, is where we we uh, we have equality, where Tusege and Parks Canada, Tusege and the GWT stand shoulder to shoulder as equals. Tusege will have to agree with all directions and all management activities within inside the internet. If there's a dispute. Uh, dispute resolution mechanism kicks in. I'm sure Larry will speak a little bit more to that. So th those are the fundamental knowledge systems that inform the relationship agreements and our responsibility within those relationship agreements going forward. I think uh, It's an example that obviously has garnered a lot of attention. We did build it off uh, of uh, other giants. It's not all of it is totally unique to us. I recognize and acknowledge the Haida, the uh, Guayanas Agreement it is something that we certainly built our relationship with Parks Canada on this and, uh, and best practices. Uh, uh, with different types of uh, uh, protected areas across the country and across the world. I would have to acknowledge that it was three parties that, are, that were in negotiations. Agreements like this doesn't come without active and willing participation by all the parties. So I acknowledge Parks Canada and I acknowledge the GWT for the willing to go that extra mile to do something different, to do something that gives life to what their politicians have been saying for the last 10 years. Creating a legal contractual agreement that recognizes indigenous authority and jurisdiction is uh, something that's very difficult for crown governments to do, especially recognizing that not uh, 50 years ago, Parks Canada wanted to create a national park and kick us out of there and not allow us to 
have a relationship within the East Arm National Park where our ways of life, responsibility, and constitutional rights, such as treaty, treaty rights and uh, Aboriginal rights recognized in Section 35 of the Constitution, would not have been possible to, to be exercised. So today we have agreements with both Crown governments as very progressive that allows us to work together as governments uh, to manage a very special area. So I just wanted to put a shout out to uh, Parks Canada and the government of Northwest Territories for being a willing and active partner in the reconciliation story that is tied to Nene. For for Sinsuke, the relationship within Saigon and Nene is an expression and an example of what reconciliation looks like for us. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, you you bring such eloquence um, and knowledge uh, to this group, and um, you share generously. Uh, there have been just some um, some moments in the chat of Kevin McNamee from Parks Canada just saying, you know, we agree. Thank you so much for the partnership. Um, or McNamee, apologies if I haven't pronounced your name correctly. McNamee. Uh, McNamee. Okay, there you go. Uh, more knowledge shared. <laughs> and um, and there was a question uh, from Megan uh, from the Grassy Narrows Land Protection Team. Um, that is uh, regarding sort of the funding model for Thaidene Nene. Um, it doesn't need to be answered right now, but I'll flag it if that's something that uh, maybe Larry or Steve um, may speak to. Are there any questions from, from anybody that would like to um, respond uh, vocally through video? I'll just give a, a moment for that. I could uh, speak to the Megan's question real quickly here. Uh, part of one, one of the mandate that was very important for the elders is that uh, we have control of our own resources. We can't be equal partners if we're always dependent on Canada to pay for our way on an annual basis. So that's where the second and then a trust fund concept was uh, born. And based on the numbers that we crunch, we determined that we need about a, annually about a million dollars for this kid to pay for it kind of the responsibility, of the, almost at the basic end. So we figured we needed about uh, $30 million for uh, in a trust fund to receive uh, uh, an annual revenue of $1 million. So what we did was we, ra we raised uh, uh, $15 million in the, in the marketplace uh, and we asked Canada to match it, not as a compensation of any kind, but as, a, as an investment in lieu of an annual transfer. We asked them to give us one lump sum. And this plays, uh, it achieves two major things. And it gives us again the comfort to move forward in a relationship with Crown governments that uh, recently had a very well, ill intention towards us. And secondly, uh, ability to uh, to uh, to fulfill our own responsibility and make investments to ensure that we do a, a good job. So that, that's what the uh, trust fund does for us. Um, it gives us comfort and uh, an ability to move forward. Canada and the tax base of Canada, after 27 years. Uh, the $15 million would have been paid off. And going forward, the taxpayers are no longer on the hook for this end of the, uh, end of the responsibility. So it's a new way of financing that's, that uh, doesn't put taxpayers on the hook in perpetuity. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other um, questions. Just a thank you for Megan for answering that. And, um, and let's, uh, 
make space now for, I think we're moving on to Larry Innes, unless um, Stephen, did you, oh no, Stephen, you just muted. Okay, yeah, so over to Larry Innes. Thank you so much. Hey, Larry. No. I'm, just, um, I'm just wondering about sequencing here. So um, if you're gonna talk about the nitty gritties of the law and stuff like that, um, and the Protected Areas Act and so on, I'd suggest that comes after my statements, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about the indigenous law piece and riff a little bit on what, but your choice, whatever you want to do. That, that actually does make sense from the sequencing perspective. So, uh, you know, we, we do this kind of as an improv act, folks. So, uh, yeah. deal with us here. Over to you, Mr. Ellis. It's, uh, this is how we did it in negotiations too, largely an improv act, right, Larry and Stephen? The, uh, so, yeah, just, just to reflect a little bit on what um, Stephen was talking about with respect to the sort of the fundamental underpinnings in Indigenous law that are foundational to Sai Din and Nene. I think one really, really important lesson that is important for everybody is that one thing that Tsutsuke really took to heart is that it was not enough for it to say that it had Indigenous law and that it was grounded in Indigenous law. It had to be and, and implement those laws um, at all times. And that predates by quite, by decades, any relationships with Parks Canada. So um, Thai Din and Nene is just an expression and one way that Futsuke is implementing its responsibilities to respect its indigenous laws, but it is just that, just one way. And it is um, not the end game in with respect to implementing an indigenous law. So when Stephen talks about that, that foundational law around Sankri Theta and the story of the old lady and the the law that was passed down to take care of her respect her area which is the you know the fundamental essentially origin story around Thai Din and Nene. Flutsuke protected and implemented that law in many many ways prior to that so Flutsuke for example goes to an annual pilgrimage where the entire community empties out and goes to visit Sankui Theta every first week in August so again very serious um, implementation of their responsibilities to uphold their end of the bargain by going and visiting and taking care of Sankui Theta and going visiting and asking for help and so on and so forth. Um, the town actually gets so deserted in those times that, uh, you know, if there was tumbleweeds, you could see them sort of rolling by. Um, I remember once that uh, a house caught on fire and there was nobody in town at the time. So the co-op manager, which was like a guy from Newfoundland, I had to like back up the water truck and put it out himself because there's nobody in town to help him. So, you know, it's basically the whole town goes back to its ancestral homelands and, and spends that time reconnecting with family and reconnecting with that land base. So that sort of narrative of people going back there is well known throughout the Northwest Territories and is sort of a demonstration of the seriousness of people's commitment to that area and their relationship, their spiritual relationship with that particular spot. And so that's, that's super important. Another sort of sign or signal of the communities um, and the First Nations sense of responsibility for implementing that law is the ways that it's protected that area before. So prior to it ever becoming um, the core of a national park reserve, the community went to battle to implement that law in many other forms through the regulatory processes in the Northwest Territories, through various environmental assessments, uh, Tsongkwi Theta itself is a pinch point on a very powerful river and it has um, some significant hydro potential and um, every decade or so uh, a group of partners will come along and kick the tires on seeing whether there's an ability to dam the area or else run some sort of um, hydroelectric um, infrastructure through the area and every single time the community has armed up essentially and uh, not literally, but uh, figuratively, and, and defended that area through um, environmental assessment and regulatory processes. And most recently was a proposal by uh, a consortium called Dese Energy, and this would have been in the 2000s, um, again, long before um, any negotiations in the park had started, and long before the community was even committed to even working with Parks Canada. But uh, this consortium came forward, it was consisted of um, actually the government of Northwest Territories, some other indigenous groups throughout the Northwest Territories and some Southern investors. And the idea was to run some, some power lines across the river. And uh, I remember the, uh, the interventions that the community made 
at the public hearings for that, where every living chief, many of them political enemies, stood up and said, you know, we, we disagree on most things, but on this one thing, we will all stand together on this. And I remember one, uh, one elder, uh, late George Marlowe, um, he actually had some water from, from the falls and actually drank that in front of the, front of the, the board that was having these hearings, kind of like Popeye eats spinach and basically said, hey, you know, I've drunk this water, I'm untouchable, what are you gonna do to me, right? So, and basically you cannot go into that area. We're talking to you nicely here. If you try to go over there, there will be consequences. So the, all that narrative and all those, that story and that, that evidence of Luke Lecay taking that indigenous law extremely seriously was extremely important for building up the moral authority and the ethical authority to negotiate how it did at the table with Parks Canada. So there's, a, a, I think, an extremely important lesson and best practice going forward that it's really, really important as much as possible to not say that you have laws, but to be those laws and to express them and to demonstrate that um, whether or not you enter into some, some formal IPCA, that you have um, foundational stories and histories and responsibilities that you will take care of regard, uh, you know, regardless of any formalized relationships with any public governments to conserve the lands. So that's, I think, a, a really, really important piece. And when it came to negotiating formalized relationships with um, both the government of North East Territories and Parks Canada, the, that decades long narrative of Lutzelke being true to its word and taking its indigenous responsibilities and legal responsibilities in that area um, very seriously were really, really important for the type of relationship that was set up ultimately, this, this shared governance, co-governance relationship at, at the end of the day. So, you know, it didn't, it wasn't, it's much easier to enter into relationships saying that you want to do things when you are actually doing those things, as opposed to them just being theoretical things that you want to do if someone gives you permission to do them. Um, Fusuke did not ask permission, it just did these things. And when Stephen talks about, it's a partnership arrangement and they, and Fusuke invited both the Governor of North East Territories and Parks Canada to participate in that partnership because they brought um, some uh, assets and competencies to the table. Um, Fusuke was quite clear that, look, we're going to be stewards of this land with or without you, come join us if you'd like. Um, we have guardians out there already. We've been doing that for 10 years, come join us if you like. Uh, we've been defending this area and protecting it um, with or without you. Come join us if you like. So um, that foundational practice. So I guess the, the, what I'm trying to say is that it's more than just having laws articulated in your narrative. It's the, the practice of those laws and the defense of those laws and the enforcement of those laws that is super, super important from the Indigenous perspective to set the table for more equivalent negotiations and conversations with public governments about around shared arrangements around governance and financing and so on. Um, yeah, so that's, I think, just a refle reflection I'd like to make on the importance of being and doing as opposed to staying. I, I think about actually sort of the father of Thaidin and Nene, which is the, the first elected chief from Kitsuke, who was elected in the six, in late 60s and 70s, uh, Chief Pierre Catholic, uh, long passed away but who's actively involved uh, until his final days in the advising of the negotiating team and driving ahead the agenda for the community. Is that one of his famous sayings was, uh, um, uh, you work it, you make it, which essentially means like, you have to do it to make it happen. It's, it's not something you can just talk about. You have to do it to make it happen. And again, that was again, a big part of the ethic behind Klitsuke and Thay Denene about not asking permission, for permission, but doing what it had to do on its own steam, um, inviting partners to help it to do that, to bring in resources, to bring in partnerships and so on and so forth. But ultimately build, building a coalition that built in Klitschke's vision, that believed in Klitschke's vision and using that, that power to, to achieve um, the types of arrangements that it needed um, to solidify the protection of this area and the stewardship of this area into the, for the long term. So I'll just leave it there, but uh, that, I think that's the, the super important part of the story of Thai Dinan. Larry. Maybe just I'll jump in and build on that because I think between your description of uh, how things were, were done and Stephen's narrative about what happened, we find an 
this is maybe where I'll jump in and uh, talk a little bit about legal foundations. These, the laws that Stephen described going back to uh, Sanqui, uh, Theda, and to the formation of the treaty in 1900 between Lutzke and Canada, uh, which Canada knows as Treaty 8, which Lutzke just calls the Treaty of 1900 because it certainly wasn't number eight for them. It was the first encounter that they had with the crown um, in which the crown and it's okay sat down to negotiate the terms of the partnership. And so over the last hundred years, as most folks on this webinar will know, Canada didn't do a particularly good job of honoring that agreement. But in every meeting that we ever attended, and certainly late Chief Pierre Catholic was always solid on the fact that the treaty was the foundation for the discussion with Canada, for the discussion with the GNWT. And that is implicit and indeed explicit in what we ultimately negotiated in the formation of these agreements and uh, in the creation, in the case of the NWT, a new law to create that legal space or that legal recognition for what, as uh, Stephen Ellis indicates, was already being done on the ground over hundreds of years by Lutzel K and her ancestors to protect that area as a, as a special place. And this is perhaps where, uh, you know, I'd encourage us all to think about law, not as something that gets written down and then somehow gains some power, but law is very much a statement of what is. Law is very much a statement of what can be. And I think in Taidin and Nene, the agreements that we've built and the relationships that we've built with the other governments that, uh, that have responsibilities and have jurisdictions in the territory really start from that place. You know, Lutzel Kay's history, the traditional laws that apply to Taidin and Nene created the context for what is. It created that history of an area that was looked after and respected in particular ways. And although, yeah, there were nibbles at the edges, you know, part of one of the big motivations for moving ahead with Taida and Nene was that other governments were not respecting those laws. There was a big push in the mid 2000s, late 1990s, mid 2000s, is when it began to peter off, but to uh, to explore the area to ultimately develop diamond mines or uranium mines or any kind of mines, really. Um, Nutsuke became the center or one of the centers of one of the largest staking rushes that ever occurred in the Northwest Territories with hundreds of exploration companies uh, hiring every available um, helicopter in the region to fly people around to pound magic sticks into the ground to, uh, to gain mineral tenders. And uh, you know, Lutzel K, of course, was incredibly opposed to that. And one of the first uh, agreements that we reached was the agreement to withdraw the area in its entirety from mineral state. And that, uh, that created a layer of additional protection where the other governments, Canada and the Northwest Territories, were uh, recognizing and upholding the special nature of this place in order for further decisions to be made. And so we find ourselves always, it seems, um, negotiating from the indigenous side of the table, finding new ways to get Canada, to get the governments, uh, the public governments, to respect the foundations on which Canada as a country or Canada as an idea exists. That there were people here living under their own laws, practicing their own ways of life, and doing so in relationship with newcomers as they arrived. And it was only when power and economic interests and population pressures began to flip that relationship from one based on mutual respect and reciprocity to one in which one, one side was able to dominate that many of the things that we now know as Canada's colonial history began to Occur. But for several hundred years in much of Canada prior to that, peace and friendship was a necessity. 
and here in the Northwest Territories where still a majority of people are indigenous, where there is a consensus form of government that is practiced by the government of the Northwest Territories, and where there is, I think, a, a real desire to strike a different balance. Things like Tadin and Nene perhaps are more possible. So the architecture of the agreements that have been reached are really relationship agreements. They're legal, they, they take the form of contracts, they take the form of laws, but they're fundamentally about maintaining a symmetry or a balance between as the as an indigenous party, Canada as the federal crown, the GNWT as the territorial administration um, representing the public interests in the Northwest Territories, that those governments together all bring something to the table in terms of jurisdictions, authorities, and responsibilities. And the agreement is really built around that model, that it's a shared decision-making structure. So in having agreed to define the territory, that is now tied to the NA. The responsibilities of the parties are described in detail in the agreements. And these are very much framed as responsibilities that allow each party in partnership with the other through a process of making decisions together to carry out those responsibilities in ways that uphold these fundamental laws, that the land will be protected that the Dene way of life will continue and that future generations should be able to access and use the area as previous generations have in a way that maintains the ecological and cultural integrity of the area. So with, within that framework, and I wanna to touch on how, how decisions get made, the board is set up to speak for the land to speak for the people and their relationship to the land, to speak for those things that have no voice, and to provide their best advice to the governments that can then carry out programs of management or operations on the land in fulfillment of those objectives. And so we've separated or tried to separate the considerations that are at the heart of Tadin and Nene and give those responsibilities to a group of people who can you know, not bring all of the, uh, the constraints to the consideration. And so you know, the, the Tadin and any board is not asked to think about budgets or to think about uh, political priorities or you know, whatever the issues of the day are that, uh, that might be of concern to a politician. They're there to think long-term for the land and for the people. They then make determinations, they provide those determinations to the parties who, let's face it, you know, each of the uh, parties to these agreements is a government and it does have to think about policy, it does have to think about money, it does have to think about other factors and other relationships. And so it's the parties who then, having received the advice from the board, have to hash it out between themselves. If they agree with the advice or the, they agree with the intent of the advice and have the ability to implement the advice, there are obligations in the agreement that they will do so. But if one or the other of the parties or perhaps both say, you know, we're not able or we're not willing to follow the advice we've received from the board for a particular reason, it's up to the parties to then reconcile the advice they've received and the direction they want to go with each other. And if they are able to come up with a better way that you know, fits what they're able to do, taking into account the advice they've received, and they agree to do that, they agree to do it. The, the process is uh, such that they implement that decision. If there's, an, if there's a disagreement between the parties, however, if Lutzel K believes that it should proceed in this way. Canada or the GNWT thinks that it should go a different way. The action is placed in abeyance and no decision can be taken, no action can be taken, except in emergencies, until there is a, uh, an effort to reconcile between parties and an agreement between them. 
And this is really building on a model that was first piloted or pioneered by the Haida in Guayanas, where the Archipelago Management Board operating in a very similar way, would provide advice ultimately to the Council of the Haida Nation and to the minister. And it was ultimately the president and the minister in person who had to settle any agreements or disagreements between them. So we adopted that model. And that was a very hard place to get to because Canada had been saying for, for years, ever since the ink was perhaps first dry on the Guayana's agreement, we'll never do that again. And it took, uh, Notice that one of the questions in the uh, uh, in the chat was, you know, was there a moment where people had to get educated? And th there was exactly that moment where uh, one of the elder advisors to Mitsuke uh, was out with the CEO of Parks Canada, uh, Alan Lacherelle at the time, and they were uh, cruising around the uh, the area that was uh, under negotiation to become the Tadinganene. And they got windbound and they ended up on the shore of an island for three or four days, uh, having only planned to be there for uh, the afternoon. And uh, over that three or four day period, uh, Francois Paulette, who's quite a significant elder in the Northwest Territories, and uh, Ellen Naturel managed to come to an agreement about the importance of shared decision making, the importance of the individuals themselves who are responsible for making the decisions to sit down in the relationship, make that decision together. And uh, when they got off the island, uh, there was an agreement that we would proceed in this way. So there were those moments, and I think that there will be many more such moments as the parties uh, get into the into the nuts and bolts of implementing what is uh, now a fairly significant undertaking. You know, folks should remember that you know, Utsal Case is a, it's a village of 500 people and a significant number of people in the community now work as guardians, as watchmen, as, uh, as the staff carrying out Utsal Case responsibilities within the territory. And there's a, you know, a huge uh, learning curve that goes along with that, not so much in how to be on the land as any people, but in how to be on the land in relationship with other governments and with visitors from other places to show them how to live under the day. So I'll end it there. So Larry, are you uh, advocating for the taking of federal bureaucrats hostage to get your way? I'm just uh, wanting some clarity on that. You know, by any means necessary, I would never advocate that uh, hostage taking should be the objective because that would be wrong. But if there are circumstances where you find yourselves trapped with a federal bureaucrat for many weeks, for many days, maybe think about Check the weather forecast before you go out. Yeah, <laughs> In interesting enough, uh, there's some uh, friends and colleagues of ours that uh, worked in Northern Labrador, the Nunatsi Abbott region, who uh, signed an MOU with uh, ECCC uh, maybe a couple of years ago around some marine planning initiatives, but very similar story that uh, Minister McKenna was going up to the, up, uh, the base camp up in the Torn Gap Mountains. Um, fog rolled in, they were stuck there for five days and she emerged convinced of the value of the area and, and a new way forward. So. No, it's a it's a tactic that's been used before, but unfortunately we can't control the weather. Mm -hmm. Relationships matter, and perhaps the weather is working for higher powers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. I hear, um, yeah, I hear a, a lot of what you're saying kind of speaks to that the the creation of an ethical space, um, which is one of the concepts that we're trying to, um, you know teach and learn about through the, the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership. And Helena's question um, kind of speaks to that, uh, you know, that, that um, need to, for, for there to be cross-cultural literacy and co-learning. And, and so the question was, um, were there any circumstances where you had to teach Parks Canada or the GNWT better ways to engage with Indigenous sovereignty and governance? And could you share an example of how this went or was received? assuming that happened. I could take a crack at that and Larry and Steve if you want to add, add your thoughts to it. It'll be, it'll be important thoughts, I think. I think one of the, the reasons for success we had at our table is that Parks Canada appointed uh, uh, open-minded young 
uh, individual as their chief negotiator. As I indicated, uh, Canada had this assimilation policy and that policy is still alive and well, even though it may not be an official policy because 100 years of uh, conditioning is difficult, especially if you're an old bureaucrat uh, that is asked to come with an agreement. And that, that the energy from, from that bureaucrat would be one of assimilation. So having uh, uh, an individual representing Parks Canada, representing Canada, uh, with, without that baggage was very important, I think, to move our, the, our agenda forward. We as a negotiating team held the pen for the first eight years of negotiations. And uh, the first two years of negotiations, as Larry indicated, uh, Canada was trying to negotiate uh, a relationship agreement with us that would see us to be advisors uh, and not like a Guay Harness or the Haida relationship. Uh, but after eight years of, uh, of working together, there was a lot of knowledge that was transferred. And at that point in time, we as a negotiating team felt comfortable in letting Parks Canada and the GWT take the pen because we felt uh, comfortable enough that uh, they will represent uh, the, the spirit and intent of the, the discussions were at at that time. Anything to add to that, Larry or Steve? Yeah, I think, I think one really, really important thing, and this, this sort of goes back to the trust fund question before, is that it's, it's one thing to have shared decision-making um, and shared management authority. So sitting around um, a board um, with your partners and making decisions of how management activities that need to play out. But it's another thing and, and just as important and maybe even more important to have shared operations as well. So by management, it's more like decision-making, strategic planning and so on and so forth. Operations, what we're talking about there is like, who's mobilizing the boat to go do a safety patrol? who's building infrastructure, who's staffing up, so on and so forth. And that was, I think, probably the most important innovation around Tide in an NA is that this is one that's sh that is shared operations as well. Guayana still mostly in park uniforms going around managing that park, right? There is the Haida Wam, but it is sort of a, 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 a program of the Haida Nation that's a little bit to the side of um, core management of the, of the national park. Um, what we see is the partners not only share in the management responsibility, but share in the operational responsibility. And for an Indigenous government or Indigenous partners to have operational responsibility, that means they have to have capital. So you need to have the ability to hire your own staff to do things. You have to have, be able to put gas in the boats, build the buildings, make, put up the signs, all that sort of stuff. So that's one thing that was critical from Klitsuke's perspective is to make sure it had the financial muscle to be able to play on a level playing field as its partners with respect to operating the park. So when decisions are made by the board, um, it goes then to all the parties and says, okay, here's a decision. Like you, you guys will make a boardwalk out here. That's what we want done. And then the parties have to decide how they will optimize their resources to give effect to that decision. So it may be Parks Canada that mobilizes its team to go pound the nails. It may be Klutzuke that does that. It may be both. But that's a really, really important um, part of the story is around that joint operations. So today, if you go to Flitsuke, there's not one Parks Canada staff person on the ground. They are coming, they're being hired and so on. Flitsuke has about 10 already and has all the vehicles and all the you know, four skidoos are being shipped over there today or tomorrow. There's you know, a large patrol boat. All these, all the, so the, the physical manifestation of Daidenene now operationally is primarily Flitsuke, which is always what was, was intended. Thank you. Um, Lynn, let us know in the chat if that answers your question around the sort of difference between shared decision making and um, joint decision making. Um, I, 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 yeah, I find everything that you're hearing. I'll jump in and just say that the nuance on that was deliberate because joint suggests that, you know, there are two parties making decisions and it, 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 al it almost you know, sets two sides of the table. Shared really means that there's really only one table 
and everyone sitting around it. Uh, um, we really did try and reflect that throughout. Now, I'll say that there are circumstances in which, although decisions may be shared, responsibilities are different. So one example would be uh, the management or the area around Sokokwe uh, Thida. That area, well, part of the National Park Reserve from Canada's perspective, it's something that we said, look, when it comes to sacred space, your minister might know lots of things, but there's no one in your system who can give them, the minister, the proper advice on how to manage this area. This is a Lutzelke responsibility, and that was written into the agreement. So those, uh, those uh, common objectives of sharing decision-making but also differentiating the responsibilities is something that uh, is uh, another element of the, uh, of the agreement. Um, thank you. A question from Kimberly Heinemeyer. Um, is the management structure, including the board responsibilities and the decision-making process available somewhere in a document for us to study? Oh, yeah. for folks who want to read these, uh, yes. So uh, there are two agreements. There's a, one with Canada and one with the government of the Northwest Territories. Um, I know the GNWT one is very accessible. It's on their protected areas registry. And a quick uh, search of the Google should turn it up. The uh, Lutzen K Canada agreement is also available on request from Lutzen K and I'm sure from Canada as well. It's, it's not a confidential document to any means. Yeah, it, it may actually, Lutzen K maintains a website called landoftheancestors.ca, which is all about Thai Dimenini. I There's a whole bunch of resource material um, and documents available there for download or for review. I think the agreements are there. Um, if not, as Larry said, a simple request. Excellent. Thank you. Um, One very interesting uh, aspect of the uh, of the establishment agreement is uh, one law we 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 that Lutzke didn't have, people have and have had for a long time is represented in the establishment agreement, which gives uh, privileges to non Dene within Thai Dene. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a there's a law that states if you go into our traditional territory. You try not to be a burden on us. Uh, you have to be able to feed yourself and defend yourself. With that law, uh, non-Section 35 rights holders in this country uh, can bring a rifle and their dog into Thaijinanana and use them to defend themselves, protect themselves, and also defeat themselves if necessary. It's very unique. Uh, it's unique to Thaijinanana. On the uh, agreement as a whole, you know, as, as I indicated, Canada had this assimilation policy. Their negotiation style is informed by that. You know, the first, first few years of negotiations, it was like negotiating a divorce agreement rather than <laughs> negotiating a, a, a relationship which could be in perpetuity. So that was, a, that was we had to uncondition uh, for crown negotiators from that uh, that attitude, we are not entering into a we're entering into a relationship, not negotiating a divorce agreement. Um, yeah, thank you. And then Lynn, um, Lynn is just continuing here with a comment. Thanks for thanks for the feedback. Uh, very interesting you shared in that nuanced and intentional way in bc as i understand it they used sdm to mean something uh, less equal than jdm as per the haida context and perhaps you can unpack those um, acronyms for us well everyone obviously is negotiating these agreements in their own contexts and uh, you know, the, the circumstances in bc and among indigenous peoples in bc their relationships with the governments there are their own um, it reflects a different history. Territories, uh, 
perhaps a little less uh, um, into drawing the lines because it's actually really quite hard to draw the lines. You know, the premier and cabinet are indigenous people who are also members of indigenous communities in the Northwest Territories, but are uh, fulfilling roles in the public government. Um, you know, Mr. Nito was a member of the Legislative Assembly, uh, helping the public government pass laws for a period of his life. He was also a chief. You know, those, uh, the, the degree to which things are literally shared here is different than in other contexts. So you know, these terms of art arise in those contexts and, you know, translation and, uh, you know, as translators and interpreters know, context matters when you're trying to give meaning to terms. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Deborah. Can you say a bit more about the how the board speaks for the land and the relationships? That was a that was a instruction from the elders in the in the in the uh, site of the new advisory committee that uh, the people that are appointed to uh, to to make recommendations and decisions on site in the speak for site in the in fact, the uh, the establishment agreement we have with the government of Northwest Territories goes even a little further than, than that. Uh, there's a wildlife conservation uh, area of the ter with, with, within the territorial protected area of Fighting Indian. That's a uh, caribou wintering grounds. In the establishment agreement, we give voice to the caribou. We say that the car that, that area will will stay in a, as a conservation area until the caribou tell us they don't need that area anymore. And we will use uh, traditional, traditional ecological knowledge of the Fusigate Dene and, uh, and the, the best science of the day to make that determination. So yeah, so, so the whole concept here is to, uh, you know, we don't bring our politics to the, to the board. We bring our responsibility of site and Dene, for site and Dene to the board. Yeah, so important to have that space um, where we can uh, connect as humans <clears throat> and share and discuss our human responsibility to um, the places that we inhabit. Um, from Zara, could someone share a bit about how youth fit into the vision and stewardship of Thai Dene Nene? Steve, I think you should take this one. Sure, yeah. So Kitsuke has a, a long-standing program called the Nihani Dene program, which is the Watchers of the Land. It started in 2008. And, uh, you know, it was sort of pieced together uh, through various funding pots, but now that Thai Dene is established, the trust fund is coming online and so on, there's a stable funding source for it, but it's effectively Litsuke's Guardian program. So um, Litsuke's Guardian program, the Nihat Dene has always uh, had crews of senior land users and youth. So typically in the summer, that uh, there's crews of two senior land users and two or three youth that go out for two weeks at a time and two week cross shifts. So there's two crews that, that exchange shifts and they're out in Thaida and NA for extended periods of time doing patrols, monitoring, cultural transmission, caretaking, important sites. It's all, all that sort of normal stewardship and guardianship activity. Um, and in the winter, um, we have senior Nihat Nidene Rangers and what are called junior Rangers. And so they, um, are paired up in groups of two, uh, a senior mentor, essentially a mentor apprentice type role. And um, this, the, uh, those crews effectively go to do caribou monitoring and winter activities in smaller sort of more, more mobile groups. And again, they go out for you know five to six days at a time in the winter. So the engagement of youth is built right into the Nihat Nidene program. And uh, there's specific um, apprenticeship and youth roles built into that program because ultimately those people will assume the mantles of the senior rangers or leadership within. So, you know, it's, it's really a pipeline of capacity for the First Nation and frankly others. I mean, uh, for example, the GNWT now has two staff on the ground in Klitsuke, uh, one is, which is exclusively responsible for the implementation of Thai Dene Nene, but both um, spent significant time as Nihat Nidene back in the day. So it's sort of flipping the script where Klitsuke is actually the training ground for capacity, not only for itself to implement Thai Dene Nene, but for its government partners as well. The, uh, the Nihadi Dene 
uh, is an excellent program. It's uh, it's we've run many many uh, training programs already. Lots of youth have gone through that program. Uh, many of those youth uh, that went through the program are working for other governments, industry. Uh, so it's it's been a good program for the youth. The Nihat Nidene is not responsible for enforcing of uh, regulations or laws. It's important to understand that. We chose not to not to fight for that because that's Parks Canada and the government of the territories can do that work. But what we try to do in our negotiations with both crown governments is to make Titan and Nina boundaries invincible for Section 35 rights holders. However, we qualified that by saying that uh, we will reintroduce the old relationships that uh, we had within Indigenous nations protocols that we, uh, we've had before uh, that, that inform how those Section 35 rights can be exercised, if it could be exercised. Uh, for example, the community uh, had made a political decision not to hunt the Bathurst caribou herd. And that has been worked through with the government of Northwest Territory so that it could be, they could use the um, Territorial Wildlife Act uh, to enforce that. It's largely a protocol that we expect, uh, uh, we, and we want our in, Indigenous people, doesn't matter from where in Canada, we respect. You know, when you go into Tuska territory or Tuska goes into Dinanuku territory or any other First Nations territories, you communicate and you express your desire. And usually there's protocols that's there, you know, uh, areas that uh, uh, should be avoided uh, for one reason or another, where the Niha Nidene will will guide the uh, uh, people that follow those protocols and assist them in harvesting within the Tlisca territory, including within Tlisca Nidene. So to revive the, the traditional protocols between the indigenous peoples is uh, also envisioned within Tlisca Nidene. Uh, Section 35 writes, uh, uh, you know, they, they give us the rights, but they don't give us the they don't talk about the, uh, the responsibility side. So Saigon and Nene and Sisege is talking a lot about responsibility. And we don't want to, uh, we don't want to uh, be the ones to, to, um, to not recognize the, uh, the constitutional rights that people have, indigenous people have to uh, uh, treaty and, and, and Aboriginal rights in Section 35 but protocols that uh, indigenous nations have had before can be reinstituted to inform how, how those rights will be exercised. And that will be the responsibility of the Sicilian, not Parks Canada or not the GWT. Thank you, Stephen. Um, how, how about how the Nihat Nidene um, connect with support or not the, um, the Guardians program? Are they synonymous? Are they is what is the connection there, if any? It is synonymous. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Um, from Aaron Hansen, uh, thank you for sharing your experience. Really appreciate learning from you. Um, did you encounter any challenges with matching Canada's capacity to carry out the agreement? We are attempting a similar agreement, but running into challenges with staff availability to conduct technical reviews of decisions. We're trying not to get trapped in the weeds of technical and administrative minutia. Canada has many staff, whereas we have just a small team. I think in this one here, um, the, the role of the CRP and what we're trying to do with the CRP, I think uh, can be explained a little bit. Tlisaga had great partners and great allies. You know, we've had, uh, we work with NGOs and, and uh, philanthropic community uh, to fulfill our, uh, what we wanted to create. And through that type of relationship, I think you could create the capacity to move forward and, and be in control of the, of the process. The CRP, to a large extent, we have many, many partners. And what the goal there for me anyways is to, to utilize those, uh, those resources and, and strengths to support Indigenous nations advancing IPCAs across the country. It's about coordinating going forward now. So, you know, 
I think it's important to acknowledge the great partners we had with uh, within the, the inclusive with Saigon and Nina. You know, we have the, the Indigenous Leadership Initiative, the International Boreal Conservation Campaign, uh, the, uh, the Nature, Nature United, um, all played important roles uh, uh, in advancing Saigon and Nina, all following direction from Kisage. So there's resources out there, there's capacity out there, it's just a matter of uh, organizing them. And, uh, and creating relationships to support an initiative like Fagan and Yenna. Thank you. And if I might add, I think also one of the legacy projects of the CRP being the Solutions Bundle, the Solutions Bundle will be, you know, an interactive online space where stories um, uh, such as that and and uh, and examples of, you know, the, how those relationships were developed and, and a lot of the questions that are being asked here um, will be told. And so, so yes, there is work being done to ensure, like Stephen said, that, that you know that that is a space for um, for learning and, and sharing and and building on partnerships and which are the you know the result of of trusting relationships. Um, so many great questions. Thank you, thank you to those who are are sharing. Um, yeah, if I can go back to Aaron's question, because I think there's there's something more about uh, you know being in the weeds on a technical issue that uh, again, agreements of this type can help remedy. One of, one of the huge challenges with uh, you know, what's often called co-management, co-management boards or structures, where you have you know, bureaucrats, civil servants on one side of the table, indigenous people and knowledge holders on another, is that, and, and this is probably well-documented now in the, uh, in the literature, is that there tends to be a a tilt that happens where the technical bureaucratic knowledge, because the conversation happens in a technical and bureaucratic form, tends to get privileged. And the indigenous knowledge or indigenous perspectives, the indigenous experience being on the ground, um, while perhaps far more relevant to the decision that's being made, tends to be uh, filtered or lost because it's hard to express those things in, you know, down in the weeds. So we've tried here again to, uh, to solve that by, and whether it's gonna be solved in all cases or not, it remains to be seen, but to solve that by having the indigenous party responsible for the actions and the activities that the indigenous party carries out. And so, you know, Lutzel K never needs permission from Parks Canada or it needs, never needs to look at a policy developed by Parks Canada to do something on the ground. They're going to follow Lutzel K's policies. They're going to follow Lutzel K's laws and directives. At the partnership level, it's up to Lutzel K as a government and Canada as a government to sort things out. But, you know, down in the weeds where things matter, you know, we want the Indigenous Party with the boots and the moccasins on the ground to, uh, to make those decisions and carry out those actions. Thank you. Um, from Darren Bagshaw. Oh, the, uh, Darren just uh, shared a link to the, uh, to the protected areas public registry. So thank you for that, Darren. Um, from Justine. Uh, what is unique and innovative about the 2019 Northwest Territories Protected Areas Act in terms of enabling Indigenous use of lands protected under it? And to what extent were First Nations and Métis in the Northwest Territories involved in the development of the Act? I'll bite. Um, so the government of the Northwest Territories is uh, it's still a new government. They uh, only received uh, responsibilities for lands and resources in 2014. And part of the commitment that Canada and the government of the Northwest Territories made to the Indigenous governments in the Northwest Territories is that there would be the co-development of legislation relating to lands and resources. And so through a, a co-development process, Indigenous government representatives, technical advisors, came together with GNWT, technical people, drafters, et cetera, 
and uh, there was a blank board on the wall. There were a number of objectives that were listed and uh, all of the indigenous governments uh, helped shape and give direction to what ultimately emerged as the Protected Areas Act. The key features of the act are that uh, while the GNWT as a public government has responsibilities for the development, implementation and maintenance of a network of conservation areas within the Northwest Territories, they effectively have to work in partnership with Indigenous governments at every step. And right from the identification of a candidate area through to the negotiation of an establishment agreement, Indigenous government participation is, is required. And there are now two examples of Indigenous governments and the government of the Northwest Territories reaching agreements using this new tool. So Mitsuke and Taiden and Nene were the first, but the community of Fort Good Hope, uh, the Gashogotne in the Satu region concluded an agreement with uh, the government of the Northwest Territories for another territorial protected area slash Indigenous protected area called Toyeta. And that was established a year following Taiden and Nene. And that, uh, that example involved uh, both the Dene and the Métis in, uh, in Rathakwai, in, uh, in Fort Good Hope. Okay, thank you. From Joe Jack, Parks Canada's Thai Dene Nene agreement um, do not or does not subscribe to the Lucelke Dene way of life. How would that kind of difference in the GNWT and Canada's agreement affect the implementation of, Thaide, of the Thai Dene Nene agreement? It might be, I think we're a little confused by the question. I, I just went and reviewed Parks Canada's agreement and it has the same language as the GNWT agreement with respect to the Dene Sotlina way of life. And that's, that's on purpose. The, the agreements, the GNWT and Parks Canada agreements are largely 80% you know, mirrors of each other. And certainly the Denisotlina way of life, um, I think is verbatim um, the same between the two agreements. So uh, any extra clarification there would be great. I'll let you clarify, Joe, in the, in the chat or, or if you would like to unmute and, and, and dialogue, that's, that's welcome as well. I don't see you in the... At the if you want me to ask, I, I can ask. Um, reading Parks Canada's agreement uh, in regards to uh, looking at the Lusaké Dene um implementation of that agreement, I noticed that there was differences between um, the federal agreement and also the GMWTs. And I thought, when I saw it, that uh, they may have some problems in implementing it if you have some differences in wording such as that, because a way of life, like here in uh, Southern Toshone and Yukon, we say Danke or our way. Um, uh, TH in Dawson would say uh, day. So it's a very, very big word as Stephen would agree to. So if you have differences between two levels of government, it may have some problems in regards to the interpretation of that meaning of that of those wordings in their implementation of those agreements. Thank you. Any thoughts or reflections? I'm sorry, I missed the, uh, the question. I was responding to another question in private chat. <laughs> Larry? Yeah, I, I guess, uh, Joe, I'm looking uh, at both agreements side by side and you know, I'm not seeing the difference that you're pointing out. Maybe this is something, uh, if you want to point to a section or a, a clause in the two in chat, we can respond that way. But ultimately, I think that the, the responsibility for Lusaga in a way of life will fall on Lusaga all the time. And, uh, you know, whether Canada or GWC supports an initiative uh, uh, or not supports an initiative that would that uh, that would see that, and then that's 
uh, not something that they have obviously seriously agree with in their relationship. But ultimately, uh, the, the agreements uh, speak to cultural and ecological uh, uh, integrity. So that's, that's let's get in a way of life, the general sort of way of life, language, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and, and I'll say that the definitions in both agreements are the same, but they're very open-ended definitions. And that, again, is by design. You know, it's really hard to, uh, uh, you know, write down, you know, as a contract, what someone's way of life is. You know, that it defies description or being contained within the four corners of a page. So you're always going to have definitions that, that look to the facts on the ground that look to, as we've defined it here, um, the evolving linkages and the ongoing relationships between the Nitzelkeit and the Sultime and Daideni Nene. And so those things have been around for 10,000 years, maybe more. Um, we hope they're around for another 10,000 years or maybe more. And that the, uh, the relationship at the time and the responsibilities, as Stephen's indicated, that, uh, that come along with those relationships are then reflected in how the management and the actions of the parties in Tadenene that unfold. One, one thing that's, in, I think, really interesting to reflect upon is that you've heard from Stephen, Larry, and I the word responsibility a ton in this, uh, in this discussion here. And Stephen just mentioned it with respect to you know, who's responsible for upholding and, and taking care of the Denisothene way of life. It's not, the, the agreement does not say Parks Canada, you are now responsible for doing that for us. You know, oh, 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 beneficial father figure, please do that for us. That's, that's no longer the way this is going forward. This is very much an assumption of awesome responsibility by the Tlutsigadana First Nation for its own people, its own lives, and its own culture and way of life. And it, in fact, the fundamental question that was posed to the Tutsi Gedena First Nation during the referendum, the all-member referendum on whether people would move forward with this or not, was are people, do people believe in themselves enough to take this massive step? That was, that was the fundamental question. And it's fair to say that those people who voted no for Thai Dene were not because they did not believe in protecting land or not because they didn't believe in economic development associated with conservation and so on and so forth, but uh, probably to a person, it was a fear that they would fail and that their people people would fail. And so, you know, we, there was an 89% uh, majority, large majority that, that said, we, we trust ourselves enough to take this leap and assume these awesome responsibilities, despite the colonial leg legacy, despite the ongoing trauma in our community, despite the wounds that we all are trying to heal from, all those sorts of things. So it was really an assumption of awesome responsibility. And I remember uh, a very, very key moment in the ratification meetings. So, you know, we had probably a year and a half of meetings um, where Steve and Larry and I would walk through the agreement with the community over and over and over again until people had confidence that they understood the, the elements of what was being proposed, what the responsibilities being assumed by the community were, and what the responsibilities and commitments of other parties and partners were. It took a long time. Um, and people were very detail oriented and got into the minutia and the weeds for sure. But uh, we invited some other people near, near in one of the final meetings. We invited uh, some First Nations leaders who had um, long standing national parks in their area. And we invited the former Grand Chief of the Decho First Nations, Herb Norwegian, who's had Man Nahani National Park in their backyard since the 1970s. And he um, was essentially posed the question by someone in the community look, you know, the agreement looks good. We all want to protect our land, um, so on and so forth. But what happens if we fail? What happens if we fail to uphold our end of the agreement? Will Parks Canada just take over? And, and Herb thought about it for about five seconds and said, yes, they will. If you guys screw this up, they have responsibilities for safety and conservation and implementing their act, and they will fill the gap that you leave behind. So this is on you. If, you. if you occupy the space that you've opened for yourself and do it in a good way and competent way and use your partnerships and your, your authorities and your assets and your resources to do that, then you should be good. But if you allow others to occupy the space that should be yours, they will fill it. And it was really, really, uh, I think, heartening for Larry, Stephen, and I that people voted overwhelmingly in favor of this thing, understanding that this is on us. 
to take care of ourselves, implement our own responsibilities, uh, our own jurisdictions, and be our own sovereign selves in our own territory. And that was a major, major, that's a major, major growth point for the community, moving that from rights, what is owed to us, to this is what we must do to take care of ourselves, that responsibility piece. And we really saw that transition over a period of 15 years in the community. The Indigenous Leadership Initiative is all about that. It's about supporting Indigenous nationhood uh, and reassume responsibility as a, as a, as a measure of, uh, of healing. IPCAs across the country has an opportunity to do that. So definitely in Saigon we wanted to ensure that Tusege uh, had the responsibility going forward and that, that not to give those responsibilities away or not to ask Canada or uh, we, everything we try to do is de de to defunct the, uh, the assimilation policy of Canada is to reassume our responsibilities and give uh, today's and future generations a sense of that responsibility. Is that for far too long, uh, we've been on one side of the $5 bill, if you will. You know, we've been, we've been fighting for rights, 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 rights. But the treaty relationship speaks to uh, the flip side of that $5 bill, the responsibility side. And, uh, and we really work towards uh, in, in ensuring that the, the Saigon and Nena represented uh, a continuation of, uh, of Lusaka and Nena responsibility as equal partners with Crown governments. Like I said, there was the, for us, it was the implementation of the, the spirit and intent with which, we, which, with which we entered Treaty of 1900. Toggling a little bit into that, um, you know, back into the, the rights, uh, rights based dialogue, a question from Ellie Bonnie um, is, could you speak to the discussions that happened at the community level to support the community in deciding to enter into legal agreements with the two governments and later to build comfort with the legal terms and their implications on the ground? How did that discussion take place in Lutzelke? Well, as I, as I indicated uh, at the beginning, it was the elders of the community that instructed the, the younger generations to, to, to explore the possibilities of creating a protected area within the heart of a homeland. So we have had uh, you know, uh, at least four years of discussions in the community before we even engage any of the Crown governments, for example. Uh, we did the we did the best of, uh, search of the best practices here in Canada and globally, and we brought all that information back to the community to hours of uh, discussions uh, before we did, uh, before we even drew a line on a map that uh, that speaks to, that that is like in Indiana today. So yeah, it was it was driven by the elders and uh, right from start to finish. Uh, they even got us to. Uh, uh, this is a very important aspect here, I think, an important message. They insisted that the, once we drew the map and named it, that, the, that the, we, a resolution was passed in the, in the hall, uh, not a band council resolution or anything of that nature. It was a resolution of the membership saying, okay, we're here now, we're going to enter into a process and it's going to take time. And, and we're going to go through the whole process and make a decision at the end of the process. Uh, no chief and council that gets reelect that gets elected during the process can stop the process. You have to have to support the process. Even if uh, you don't support Titan and Nene, and if you get elected, you can't you can't uh, stop the process. And we've had that we've had chief and councilors that are elected that didn't support any type of protected areas uh, but because of that resolution instructing them by the membership they had to follow the process and at the end of the day when the membership voted uh, that was the like i said the, uh, if we didn't have that we may have had problems internally i think so this is an internal process that uh, uh, that locks in the locks into the leadership and future leadership uh, to to support a process and one thing that we we only use band council resolutions 
uh, strategically. All the decisions uh, that were made by Klitschke was done through uh, a membership uh, and the people. Uh, resolutions at the membership level only supported through council resolutions if need be for legal reasons. I want to go back as well to the idea that uh, you know what's happened here for 10,000 years or more is Litzelke has been using layers of law and this is the most recent but certainly not the last layer of law that's going to be placed on the on this area and, and the people's relationship with this area there'll be future agreements there'll be a uh, you know, ultimately uh, this in case is part of uh, the acacio who are seeking the implementation of their treaty with canada in a modern form there will be other arrangements, there'll be other uh, structures that, uh, that will be developed down the road to deal with some of the things that happen outside of the boundaries of Taidin and Inu. You know, there's migratory caribou that uh, you know, cross uh, many different jurisdictions and lines that people have drawn on maps and developing relationships to manage those bigger sets of relationships between people and the caribou in a good way in light of climate change, in light of all the things that are happening in the world, will be another set of challenges. And uh, there'll be new laws, there'll be new decisions that Leeds okay will have to make to face those challenges. So this is uh, by no means the end of the story. And that's perhaps another reason why um, the agreement was so successful in being supported by members, was they saw it as a step, certainly not a final step, to fulfilling their responsibilities on their lands. Yeah, I would say another thing that goes to sort of the fairly extensive community meetings around even preparing for entering into negotiations and discussions with both Parks Canada and the GWT is that people really honed in on very clear instructions of what they were trying to achieve. And really, we as a negotiating team had one um, or, or three very simple mandate items that never changed regardless of who was chief or who was elected or whatever and it was it was essentially the same sorts of laws that came down from the old lady legend just expressed in, in modern ways and the first one was protect the land from industrial development number one number two don't give up the land so maintain sovereignty and jurisdiction over the land and three um, which was in the third is probably slightly of a slightly lesser one it wasn't a have to have it was a nice to have which was build up a, a bit of a sustainable local economy associated with protecting the land. So that's another, those were the three major pieces. And because Parks Canada especially checked the boxes on, on most of those, it was the strongest protection legislation in the country. They had a history of entering into, um, or ex at least being willing to discuss shared management arrangements. And lastly, they have, they bring some economic might and marketing to the table. So it made our job as negotiators quite easy in that, that, those three mandate items never varied. And those were the, that was the lens through which all things were assessed when we went back to the community to say, this is what we've achieved. They would say, well, how, how does that achieve these three fundamental mandate items? I should just say, I noticed that uh, Corey Myers is on and he is the general manager of Frontier Lodge, which is owned by the First Nation, which is part of that vision around um, implementing that sustainable economic development opportunity associated with Tidin and Inne. So. You know, it's not just about management. It's not just about um, protecting land. It's also about an economic vision for a place that's quite isolated from the rest of the world and uh, needs to build. Um, has economic vision that is, uh, in some ways, more difficult to achieve than other places. But uh, it, you know, it's, some of the pieces are starting to be put in place for that. Thank you. And related to that, um, a question from Georgia Lloyd Smith um, from West Coast Environmental Law. Hey, Georgia. Um, a big thank you. And then um, she says, many nations interested in establishing IPCAs in their territories are frustrated by existing or proposed mineral tenures, forestry licenses, and other extractive industries. How did you secure agreement to withdraw min mineral tenures? And do you have any advice for other nations wanting to do the same? We got lucky. <laughs> there, there, there was, there was basically none. So, for a few reasons, is that uh, Stephen uh, 
very early on in his discussion mentioned the days of Jean Chrétien when he was the Minister of Canadian Heritage and uh, the older, the elder Trudeau was the Prime Minister. So when they were told to pack up their maps and go and forget about talking about a national park in the territory of the Tlutsiga Dana First Nation, um, they, the federal government at that time did make a promise saying, okay, um, we'll, we'll let you guys think about it. And in the meantime, we'll put down a land withdrawal that will protect this area until such time as a decision is made on whether it should become a national park or not. So that was put in place in 1970 and that only got taken away when the actual formal national park was established. So that land withdrawal prevented any tenures or, or proprietary interests being registered within the core part of Thai Dinh Nene um, for you know, 45 years, essentially. Um, in 2007, when the area of interest for Thai Dinh Nene was expanded and there was a formal MOU to enter into negotiations with Parks Canada around a potential national park in the area, um, a larger area of 33,000 square kilometers, uh, much lar larger than what Thai Dinh Nene is now, was withdrawn as well. So again, a small withdrawal in 1970, a much larger withdrawal in two, uh, 2007, I believe. And so that essentially preserved the land while the national park conversations were underway so that there wouldn't be a whole bunch of mineral tenders registered. So when it came time to make the national park, I don't believe there was any. Is that right, Larry? There was none. Yeah, well, there, there's another element to this because of course, during that period where the small land withdrawal of some 7,000 kilometers uh, maintained kind of the, the four country uh, lakeshore from development, there was, as I mentioned, a huge staking rush. And in the period, probably from 95 to 2005, there were mineral claims staked. There were um, a lot of interests. Uh, um, lay down on the territory. But at the same time, uh, uh, Chief Stephen Nita, as he, as he then was, was uh, leading a, uh, a, the other side of the campaign, which was putting companies on notice that uh, they were expected to obtain Mitsuke's consent for any mineral interests in the territory. And that, this is far bigger than Tadeh and Nene, throughout the entirety of the territory. And uh, Mr. Ellis is uh, director of lands uh, with the uh, Keicho Treaty 8, uh, wrote many letters to many companies uh, basically saying, yeah, we see you have a mineral claim. You know, shame you'll never be able to develop it without our consent. And uh, you know, occasionally lawyers got involved and uh, launched court cases against mineral companies that uh, ended in, in some cases, victories, but in certain other cases, uh, simply scared them away. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the idea that, you know, everyone was like, oh, yeah, tied in any, what an awesome idea. And we had no opposition in the meantime. Uh, you know, it certainly wasn't the reality. There were lots of, uh, lots of adverse interests up to the final, the final days. Uh, you know, our friends in the mining industry uh, did not give up territory uh, easily or willingly in many cases. Although I will say that uh, as the, idea took root and as support built and as public support grew, it became much harder for any responsible companies, any responsible investors to uh, be seen to act in ways that would be adverse to tied in and established. So there were a combination of strategies, but interim line withdrawals and uh, having those protections absolutely created them the space for, I'll say, reasonable conversations about where to draw lines as opposed to having to fight them all the time. Yeah, I think uh, one of my favorite sayings as a chief was, uh, I don't have much control, but I do, I can control the creation of uncertainty for your investors. And I think uh, the uh, Cato exploration uh, agreements and guidelines uh, uh, grew from the uh, Supreme Court decision in Mikasu Cree, where the judge pretty much said, if you want to be consulted in your territories, to develop a, a process of how that should be done. So we did that. And uh, you know, the, the fact that the Tlutsuga has been pushing back against development for years uh, within that area, uh, 
book was also something that the industry knew as well. So I didn't know if the area of interest uh, that was withdrawn was 33,000 square kilometers. At the end of the day, uh, we got 26,300. So areas that, that have high mineral potential or areas that, that have no mineral information at all uh, were with, uh, taken out of, of the area of interest. Uh, it's important to understand that the uh, takes the position that this is our land, we have a responsibility to manage it. We'll do it through Saiten and Nene, but we also do it through uh, regulatory bodies, and we do support some type, types of uh, industry, because we, we need to diversify our economies and our young people get to work. So Tlisiga is not opposed to development. How development is done, where development is done, is uh, something that uh, we're highly keen on representing our interests in. Thank you. I'm, I'm noticing the time. We have a few minutes left, so I'll ask one last question, then I would like to ask our speakers to just share any concluding thoughts, maybe speaking to the nations that are on this call that are, in the, that are establishing IPCA's words of advice um, to close. Um, so from Sam Harrison, could you elaborate a little on how trust was, fa was funded, how the trust was funded, not trust was funded, how the trust was funded, and if it is only used for operations? Uh, we, through the relationships we had, we've, uh, we, we managed to raise 15 million in Canada, matched it, and we created a, a trust fund. The fight in a trust fund, which is owned by the First Nations. Uh, there's uh, some trustees that are appointed, and they'll be managing the, uh, uh, the investments and responsibilities and so on. The First Nations government themselves will make the, the decisions of how the revenues from the trust will be will be uh, used. Through the establishment agreements, there's legal responsibilities for the first order of expenditures. And depending on how well the trust does, there may be money left over. And at that time, uh, others and other organizations can can uh, uh, submit proposals to the chief and council of the day uh, and uh, for their investment considerations. Uh, maybe Steve, uh, you want to add something to that? Sure yeah, I, I think, I mean, Stephen just mentioned that there's sort of an order of expenditure from revenues generated from the trust. The, you know, the first priority is the fulfillment of Litsuke's management and operation responsibilities as outlined in the agreement. So that's the first priority. Um, there's three others that the trust fund can be used for. Um, one is um, training uh, and education associated with um, building the capacity of the First Nation to manage and operate the site in an Another is investment in um, conservation economy type um, initiatives. And the other is promotion of the Dene way of life. So, um, you know, making sure the language is strong, making sure the culture is strong, because that is part of the essential cultural landscape of Thai Dene Nene, and part of the core competencies for being able to manage it and operate it as well. So that's what the trust fund can be used for. I would like to also let people know that you know that the the next webinar on the um, I thank you from Sam there next webinar on December the third will be an opportunity to ask uh, some of the questions that we haven't had an opportunity to get to today. Um, so I would like to uh, thank Stephen, Steve, and Larry for everything you've shared today. Um, there's so much to tell. It's such an a, a extremely important story, one that is thousands of years in the making. Um, so two hours certainly isn't enough to cover it all. But uh, maybe just some closing words um, in whichever order you uh, you choose to, uh, words of advice to nations and words of, of support. Well, I would just say that, uh, like this again, if you are interested in creating a protected or conserved areas within your territories, it is your responsibility. It is your decision to move forward and your initiative and responsibility to make it happen. Take the lead, own it, share the responsibility if you don't have the capacity. There's uh, lots of friends out there that, that didn't exist uh, when uh, we started this process. Uh, there's, uh, but there are friends out there and uh, there are people that, out there to support uh, your initiatives. Uh, the CRP has been one, ILI, Indigenous Leadership Initiative, ESOC alum, uh, many of the folks that are on the call today uh, 
are there to support the, these type of initiatives. So it is your responsibility. Use it to, uh, to, build, uh, to build and heal uh, your communities and membership and, uh, and to reassume your responsibilities. One thing I would say is that uh, I think it's, um, Tlitsuke learned a lot from others who broke trail for it. And uh, Tlitsuke is quite open to sharing as much as possible with others who want to build on what it's been able to achieve. And hopefully others will do better than Tlitsuke. And, um, and everybody, every successive agreement will be, will, will raise the bar even further. So um, feel free to reach out. Tlitsuke is quite open to sharing documents, quite open to getting on calls, quite open to doing knowledge exchanges and so on and so forth. Um, the more that people share, the better it is for everybody. And also um, there's no point in everybody reinventing the wheel in their sort of, you know, isolated in their community. Let's, let's build this into a broader network where people are building on, a, on what each and other have achieved. Couldn't have said it better myself, just to say that uh, this is now the new floor. This is a precedent for how, uh, how Canada in establishing new national park reserves in partnership with Indigenous peoples, uh, recognizing the space for Indigenous protection, recognizing Indigenous jurisdiction. That, that's where things are now pointed. And steps back from that would be ob obviously um, you know, met with resistance. And for all those who are you know, trying to you know, create this space in their own territories, um, having this as a precedent, having relationships with communities that are working in this way can only help you in your own struggles. So, uh, Masi. Well, thank you all so much. Thanks to all who have joined today and uh, we will see you on December the 3rd. I'll share the screen right now so that you can have a reminder of what's happening there where you can ask anything you didn't get to ask today and more um, to uh, these speakers and others. So have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Stay safe. Wash your hands. And two caribou's apart. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Uh...